Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for waiting. And uh, I understand that it's right after tea. So not the best lot, but yeah, still, thank you everybody for making it. Today we'll discuss aspects about uh, HTML5 games and uh, as to why HTML5 games is the need of the hour, both for uh, publishers and developers. When we say publishers, it isn't necessarily uh, a Nazara-like publisher. Nazara has just made its entry, but uh, uh, more about, uh, so we, we see a publisher as anybody that has uh, a good user base and that's open to adding content from outside. And we'll discuss more about how publishers have grown uh, through HTML5 games that we have provided. Similarly, for developers, we'll uh, throw aspects about uh, the, the technology that HTML5 is, how the tech is ready, and why it's probably the right technology to invest in. So this talk will be divided into three parts. I understand that uh, not everybody here in this room may be familiar with what HTML5 is, so I'll briefly touch upon that. Then we'll t touch about, t touch uh, base with some of uh, the publishing aspects of uh, HTML5 gaming and finally we'll come to developers. So what are HTML5 games, right? Yeah. I worked very hard on that animation, it didn't come out that nice, but well, whatever. So, uh, well, HTML5 games are those that are supported on a mobile as well as a desktop browser, right? Um, they are largely environment and operating system agnostic. When I say environment and operating system agnostic, it means these are games that should work irrespective of whether you're playing them on an iPhone, whether you're playing them on an Android device, or whether you're using your Windows laptop to play them. The operating system or the environment, let's assume, for example, that you're playing a game on you know, an Android 4.0 device on a UC browser, on a 2G connection, the game should still work, and it shouldn't just work, maybe say, on an iOS setup on iPhone. Right. So it becomes pretty important for HTML5 games to work across the variety of platforms that they should work on. Hopefully, they should work well on as well. And finally, the last misconception about HTML5 games is that they are only games that can be played online, which is untrue. HTML5 games are very much playable offline, uh, and that becomes a very, very important aspect uh, for us to evangelize HTML5 games because Unlike native games which can't be played, you know, without the need to install an application, HTML5 games can be played. As you're aware, these are games that are played on the mobile browsers and desktop browsers. And finally, one advantage that native games do offer, however, is that they are compatible with offline playability, and so are HTML5 games, right? So this is a little bit about HTML5 games, and uh, obviously, towards the end of this conversation, we can welcome more questions about any understanding on aspects of HTML5. A little bit about GamesOp. We are a game publishing company. Uh, we work on a three-pronged model. We acquire high-quality HTML5 games from international developers. In India, we optimize these games to ensure that these games work across all the platforms that we spoke about. And finally, we work with partners that have a lot of traffic at their disposal. We work with browsers, we work with messenger, messaging applications, we work with video applications, we work with travel applications. To ensure that at the back of these applications our games reach the masses, whoever de the developers are who have invested time and money into developing these games, we take it upon ourselves as our prerogative to ensure that these games do reach a lot of users. We are also the only HTML5 publishing company in the world that's introduced real money into HTML5 games which means that our users stand a chance to win real money and cash it using Paytm for playing HTML5 games, which is not something that's been done anywhere. There is a lot of conversation about, yeah, please, you have a question? Is it legal? Sorry? Legality. Right, so I'll, I'll come to legality. Maybe during the questions we could take that, right? Yeah, uh, so we are the only ones that are doing real money in HTML5 games, which means that you could have a cash in, cash out model happening on HTML5 games through playability on the browser. Right? This is where our business stands today. We have published over 200 games. Uh, we have licensed these games from about 40 game developers worldwide. Uh, we have 75 partner publishers. When I say partner publishers, these include messaging applications like Facebook Messenger, Hike, travel applications like Xigo, and a bunch of these browsers that we work with. We have 1.5 million daily active users and roughly 22 million unique visitors that play games of games globally. And we are seeing about 15% month on month growth uh, as we are scaling this business in terms of user and revenue numbers.
right? The first part of the conversation, as I promised, will be a little bit about publishers. And again, I'd repeat, when I say publishers, these aren't necessarily you know, game publishers, but any application or any website that has traffic can very much integrate our games very, very easily and benefit in several ways. What are these? The first is, obviously, it's a huge impetus to engagement, right? Now, just on the Play Store, there are about 300 plus applications and not necessarily gaming applications. In fact, we don't work with gaming applications. We work with applications in other categories that have 1 million plus installs and also HTML5 games. Of these 300 plus applications, GameZop works with roughly one fourth of them. So about 75 odd applications on the Play Store that have these kind of user numbers source our games. These could be messaging apps, like I said, web browsers, content apps, travel apps, news, and the list goes on. You know, We don't have any category restriction in terms of who we want to work with. As far as they have good user numbers and they're open to trying content, we are happy. What we provide to developers is, or publishers, I'm sorry, is a ready-to-plug portal. This is what the portal looks like. It has close to 200 games. Each game has a leaderboard integration. So although we have acquired these games from other developers, our own SDK goes into each game to ensure that there is leaderboard compatibility so that you aren't necessarily playing a game like you, you would, like, you know, maybe you would on a mini clip or back in the flash gaming days when you're playing a game and just sort of coming out of the experience, it's not as isolated. You can very much challenge people to beat your score and so on and so forth. And like I finally said, you know, there is real money component which is completely end-to-end -end sponsored by GameZop. The top scorers, we have about five games that we launch as contests every day. The top scorers of each of these games about 3,000 users in total get rewarded in cash prizes, which is a huge driver of stickiness. End-to-end, -end, completely powered by us. This is not something that we ask the publishers to do. For the publishers, the integration is extremely simple, which I'll just come to in a minute. The next part is about, you know, oh, sure, we boost engagement, but, so, well, a lot of things can boost engagement, but how are you, along with engagement, also bringing monetization on the table? Now, when we work with a lot of travel applications, we realize that these guys have a lot of users, a lot of engaged users, but they want to still find ways to monetize because a lot of these users could be from tier two, tier three cities. Monetization isn't the easiest. In-app purchases is not something that works in India, especially on apps that are non-gaming. So what do, what do we do? We, what we do with them is we run ads on our games and on our portal and share 50% of the advertising revenue with these publishers. When I say publishers, these applications that take our content, that take our portal, whatever the ad revenue is, 50% of that is given to them. So that it's their user base, our content, and together we have a business understanding from day one. We have several categories of ads that we run. The first is display ads like these ones. So what you see here is just the portal that I showed to you in the previous slide. On this portal page, when you scroll, there are display ads. There are sticky ads, also known as footer ads over there, high paying ECTMs. And finally, there are mid-roll and pre-roll advertisements, which are like video advertisements or interstitial advertisements that come up either before a gameplay or during a gameplay, right? Uh, Google's been a huge support to us in this. I think uh, uh, if any of you want to try your HTML, try your hands at HTML5 games and you want to monetize it, I think, uh, the best solution out there in the market is called AdSense for Games. Uh, clearly, we've tried a lot of solutions, but I think AdSense for Games is the one that clearly stands out uh, as far as uh, monetization is concerned and uh, also fill rates are concerned, right? So, which is what we do. So the first aspect that we discussed was about how we essentially are driving engagement because the users have one more reason to come to your application, no matter what your category is. The second is, of course, you know, if you're engaging the users, might as well monetize them. So we have several methods of non-intrusively engaging the users with advertisements, which I've shown to you here. And finally, the reason why, you know, HTML5 games should be tried by publishers and app developers and website owners of all kinds is because our portal is super easy to integrate, right? It's super, super easy. It takes 30 minutes of development effort. We give you one unique URL with your publisher ID so that we can track users and revenue against you. As soon as you do that, there is instant monetization happening. As far as we are concerned, we only work with applications that have a good user base. So the moment users start coming to our portal, we start monetizing. All our, develop, our publisher partners get daily revenue reports so that you, they have an understanding of how much revenue was made the previous day. And finally, at the end of the month, they get a monthly invoice report. So just to rewind all of this, what we do is we give them a portal that they take 
and which they inject into their application. On that portal, we have ad-driven monetization. We also have users uh, having the incentive at real money, which means that you know the session lengths tend to be really, really long because they want to really, really try and make that high score to pocket some cash. In the whole process, whatever ad monetization has happened, 50% of that is shared with whoever is bringing us the traffic. So it's our content, our portal, fully plugged in, ready to use, and basically monetization starts from day one. All of that with 30 minutes of integration effort. That is why we really feel that publishers who have uh, maybe a good base of users, either on their app or website, should definitely try this out. It's it's something that a lot of our partners have benefited from. As I said, we are doing close to 2 million daily active users, all of which is at the back of other networks that are bringing us these users. Part two, which is, I think, probably uh, going to be a slightly more keen part of this discussion is why should developers do it? Because I understand that a lot of us could be developers. I clearly see some familiar faces. I think the first reason to do HTML5 games is because I think now the tech is ready. Uh, for long, HTML5 was seen as a substitute to Flash games because Flash games, uh, Flash has seen its share of ups and downs, uh, and you know it was deprecated as a standard by giants. But uh, I think HTML5 as a t standalone technology today is ready. It's it's burgeoning with activity everywhere, and uh, yeah, at the back of this, what we see is that there are a lot of robust engines and frameworks that are out there for developers to go out for and to develop games, which has become easier than ever. I think Construct 3, previously the, the second version of Construct, I think has seen the heyday of Construct. Construct 2 and now Construct 3 have done really, really well. And some frameworks which have come up are pretty, pretty interesting, like 3JS and Babylon and so on and so forth. Interesting 3D rendering options that these guys introduce. So even on HTML5, I think there was a long-standing belief that HTML5 can only be used to make simpler games. But if you see some of the HTML5 games that are coming up these days, both in terms of the complexities of their ecosystems and in terms of the experience that it offers to the users, I think uh, you know, the writing is on the wall that these games are going to become an important force to reckon with in the overall gaming industry. Also invest in HTML5 games because the app stores are pretty flooded. A stat released by Google and Flurry and you know, uh, data analytics uh, agencies in the gaming and monetization space says that about 94% of the revenues from Google Play is made by 1% of the developers, right? So unless you're a really, really big developer with a lot of uh, wherewithal to spend to acquire users and wait for some gestation period to actually start being profitable on every transaction that you make, transaction being starting from the cost that you incur to acquire that user to eventually you know, calculating the lifetime value of the user. I think you, know, you might either go to a publisher to sort of take your games uh, to the last mile and publish them, and then they can put their financial muscle behind getting you users, or you can turn to HTML5, because unlike the app stores, even for indie developers, messaging apps are now open. Right? The biggest one out there and the biggest support that I think HTML5 has seen in the recent times has come from uh, Instant Games on Messenger. I think um, um, some of the companies out there have done really, really well to leverage Messenger really well. I think uh, compared to the Play Store, the last I checked, I think the Play Store had close to 1.3, 1.4 million gaming applications. Right now on Facebook Messenger, there are 4,000 uh, sort of HTML5 games, and Facebook is doing a decent job of promoting it. A lot remains to be desired, of course, it's not fully out there. The ecosystem for this also needs to mature. But it, I think uh, this is a good way for Facebook to have put their door, uh, for, put their foot in the HTML5 door for HTML5 games actually rather to have found its foot in Facebook's door to uh, have come so far. This isn't the only one. Um, there are also a lot of other messaging apps that we work with and if you're an indie developer probably you should work with if you're developing web games, HTML5 games. Um, uh, Russian messengers like Telegram and OK and VK and so on and so forth are doing a decent job. And so are some North American messengers like Kik. Allegedly Snapchat is also now doing a lot of work with HTML5 games, but I guess that's a little bit of a closed loop that still requires some unraveling. 
but all in all, I think the opportunity is out there for developers to quickly make some HTML5 games, invest some time and effort rather than take the traditional Play Store or the App Store out and where monetization is where a rare reality. Instead to launch a title and quickly spend some money and try and see the light of the day on some of these messaging applications which are doing pretty well. Finally, uh, this may not sound the, like the most interesting option out there, but uh, well, if you are an, an indie developer and also have some interest in HTML5 games, we are always open to contractual opportunities, not just GameZop, but there are a lot of companies out there, a lot of publishing companies in Europe that will exclusively or non-exclusively buy your HTML5 games with the source code or without it depending upon whatever your arrangement is to, and pay you maybe a one-time licensing fee. There are some models in which developers continue to get a share of the revenue that's being made from uh, HTML5 games. And we are very happy to uh, sort of buy HTML5 games if you have developed any. Like we said, we have worked with close to 40 developers from around the world. We have acquired a lot of these titles. We have a fair understanding. And we'll be happy to help people hone their skills in HTML5 gaming. We are big uh, believers in this space and that's pretty interesting to us to see developers from India make HTML5 games because not much has happened so far. Like in bits and pieces, yeah, there are the right noises that are coming through, but I think most action for HTML5 games as far as we see is coming from outside India. So if there are interest, please pass the word around within your communities that we are really looking to buy high quality HTML5 games. We come to the last part as to what is the future for HTML5 games because so much has been spoken about it. Uh, there are all sorts of discussions about whether this is in some ways because now Google on the Play Store has introduced instant apps which in some ways is a prototype uh, version of the real game which uh, hopefully they'll open on HTML5 and then Facebook Messenger has done a lot of work and so on and so forth. And the, the set that comes together when you talk about HTML5 seems to be right because the text there, the model is scalable, it doesn't require an install, it can leverage somebody else's distribution because a lot of guys have already set up their distribution. HTML5 games can go inside those applications and see a lot of users. Also, you know, no matter how big a company you are, when you launch a new title on the Play Store, on the evening of the launch, the user base for that is zero, right? <laughs> However, if you have an HTML5 game and you introduce that HTML5 game on GameZop, we can guarantee that the next day about 2 million users are going to play that game because that's our reach. And we can ensure that that many users are playing these games because everything even on our partners is handled at the back end by us. So that's the kind of scalability that HTML5 provides. Sure, there are still things that remain uh, to be achieved as far as you know, maybe the complexity of the ecosystem is concerned and so on and so forth, which is what I see the future beckoning for us. I think these games will become more and more complex. They'll come uh, a time when I think it'll become almost on par with native games. Native games are also improving a lot in terms of where they were from a, a few years down the line. And it's, it's a tough chase, honestly, for this kind of a technology. When it's open across all the platforms, when it's platform agnostic, the same game has to be optimized for Android and iOS and some of these things separately. So it's not going to be easy, but as far as we see, the times to come would obviously see more complex games with layers and levels and in-app purchases coming along. A lot of these guys have already opened their platforms of in-app purchases, like VK is probably the one that pioneered this in Russia, that opened HTML5 games up for in-app purchases, now Facebook messengers followed suit, and so have some of the other guys. So I think, yeah, ecosystems will get more complex, game depth will increase, and it needs to as this technology and system evolves. In ga game purchases is going to be what is eventually the driver of revenue. So far, it is fair to say that whoever is making money from HTML5 games is either making money from licensing these games, which could be the developers who are licensing, licensing it to publishers like us, or from advertising, right? Because when we take these games to a lot of partners uh, who want to distribute these games, the primary source of monetization is essentially advertising. But in-app purchases really, really would you know, change the game altogether, uh, which is what we have tried to do at GamesUp. So not uh, in-app purchases in the traditional manner where you pay for a sword or to change level or something of that sort. But we have started to have transactions on HTML5 games through the introduction of real money. So if you're working with a partner that only and only has its presence on an app, then we only have a cash out model, so users don't have to pay anything. 
but they, they can sort of the top 3,000 winners or 4,000 winners, whoever the highest scorers are of that day could walk away with cash prizes. Whenever we work with browsers, however, we have a cash in cash out model. So users can also participate in the form of pooling in some money. Uh, so for example, the participation fee could be five rupees or 10 rupees or whatever. This is microtransactions. And of the 1,000 winners or 1,000 users or contestants that pull in five rupees or 10 rupees, maybe two or 300 of them, whoever the top scorers are would be awarded the sum of the total prize money. So if the prize pool is 1,000 or let's say 10,000 rupees, if that's what we have made from 1,000 users pulling in 10 rupees each, then maybe 9,000 rupees could be distributed to uh, a group of 300 odd users, which is what becomes pretty interesting for them, right? So I think in-game in purchases or in-app purchases is going to be very, very, very big when it comes to HTML5 in a bigger manner than what it is today. And lastly, the point that we see about HTML5 games is ubiquity. Uh, everything that is hyper casual or super casual will sooner or later start to turn to HTML5, be it games on in-flight entertainment. They have those archaic games that have withheld the test of time for some reason, but not anymore, I guess, because uh, it's, it's an easier technology to work with. Um, uh, you have more number of options with HTML than what those games that you see on in-flight entertainment uh, currently offer. Uh, even other ways like restaurants and a lot of these travel apps and so on and so forth. Everybody who wants to create a content destination has always wanted to add games. The reason they haven't added games is because traditionally games required an installation, especially on the mobile phone. But with HTML5 that changes altogether. So I think a lot of this is going to become a lot more visible. Uh, on messaging applications, on travel applications, on news applications. As we speak, we are working with all of these guys. So I think newer categories of applications would probably open doors to HTML5 games. And that should become really, really interesting. Right. Yeah, so that's us. In case you want to try out our portal, please visit games.gamesop.com. Uh, you could see how we are engaging the users with uh, cash incentives, how users are able to very, very easily transact with uh, money on our platform and how they're very, very easily able to uh, encash all their earnings if they make any. Uh, it's not easy to defeat our engaged users, mind you, so please don't go with the hope of earning cash on day one. It's not going to happen. Our users are very engaged. But yeah, do give it a shot, okay? I guess with that, I'll come to the questions, if any. I, I believe you had some questions. And uh, yeah, I have been instructed to show you this uh, very pretty QR code. So in case you have any feedback, please feel free to pass it on. Yeah, open for questions if any. You, you mentioned like there is a cash in cash out thing. Uh, what is the legality of this? Uh, is it uh, allowed in India jurisdiction? So well, there are a lot of aspects even within the legal domain uh, that are up for discussion. Uh, but there are some facts that are established. First, there's a differentiation between games of skill and games of chance, okay? Uh, so when you talk about games of skill, right, uh, you can transact on cash with them, which means that users can put in money and if they win, they can take out money. Games of chance, let's assume that, uh, sorry, ca casino, casino games. not all, but some, most casino games, right, where there is an element of randomness involved where um, you could uh, be rolling a dice or where you could be given a set of cards that you have no control over. Some of those would largely fall under games of chance where transacting is a little trickier and where a lot of judgments have been passed by various courts in the country. With games of skill, it's slightly easier. Even after that, I guess, you know, that is one aspect of it. And in, in a lot of cases, the court doesn't clearly uh, fall, believe in your definition of what a game of uh, skill could be. For example, we believe that all the games on games of are games of skill because the user starts at a point and the user and the environment or the factors that the user is subject to is the exact same for everybody. So if you go ahead and you truly are the top scorer in a game, you are the top scorer in a game, you have contested against 10,000 people and you have emerged as the top scorer. But I guess there are definitional challenges which are being discussed. There are a lot of societies that are being formed in this country. Um, I could I could share some details with you offline where a group of real money guys, real money gaming guys like GameZop and of course a lot of others who have been around for much longer than we have, have decided to come together to at least 
I have a blueprint of some standard practices. Even after this, I guess there are irregularities with practices of indirect taxation. For example, on every uh, buck that we collect from the user, we're supposed to charge an 18% GST. So there's still, there are some issues because a lot of players believe that it's not fair as a business practice. You should only be eventually paying GST if, you know, on the net payment of sorts, because otherwise it becomes quite an issue. There's, there are challenges around direct taxation also which largely talks about if you're giving the user some earnings, technically speaking, those earnings are subject to tax, but at what point do you start deducting it? One definition says that as soon as the number reaches 10,000, you should start deducting TDS, right? But you can't deduct, you, you can't deduct, start deducting tax at 10,000 because the definition also says that the moment it reaches 10,000, you should deduct it on the entire 10,000. So what if the user has made 9,990 rupees? the next 10 rupees you can't uh, deduct. So which means that you actually have to start deducting taxes a lot sooner than that. So there are still some challenges that a lot of players, not just us obviously, there are much larger players in the real money business are trying to sort out. And yeah, we are following that space very, very closely. Thank you. So uh, if there are no other questions, I'd just say that if there are indie developers in this room, uh, please feel free to reach out. If you already have, a lot of us experiment with HTML5 games because it's easy to prototype and so on. If there's a real idea that we see behind it, we'll be very happy to acquire those games, uh, pay you upfront licensing fees for that game, even work on a revenue sharing model so that when these games are taken to other markets through Facebook Messenger, through, others, through the other partners that we have who are able to bring us a lot of numbers, we'll be happy to share our proceeds with you. And I guess, as I said, this space is pretty interesting. It's very promising. Not so much happening in India, unfortunately, but if you ever tune into discussions happening in global forums, I think HTML5, has started to find its place in some of these very intent discussions, right? So please let us know in case that's there. Yeah. Uh, this just came out, came in my mind right now that uh, what's the actually procedure for dev developers to connect with you guys? I mean, uh, I mean, uh, so, and how long does it take actually? One email. One email. And how long does it take for for the uh, things to proceed? Because so, uh, in instant yeah. game, uh, to be a developer, we have to submit some business documents and they review it and then it's done. We are developer. So we have cut down on all of that. Uh, okay. We don't ask you for a game design document. We just look at your end game um, and uh, like in its final state, if even better if you want to communicate, uh, communicate with us while you are building that game so that we can share some feedback with you. We may have screened over 5,000 odd HTML5 games, so we have, we have a good understanding of what's going to work, what's not going to work. And we will be very happy to share insights. If the game in its ready state is already good enough, we'll just take it the way it is. We'll sign an agreement with you and we'll take it. Okay. If there are issues around the game, like if performance is an issue or art cell is an issue, uh, sometimes we'll tell you to just fix those issues and you know give the game back to us if you think that those aren't really major ones because as it is when we buy games we buy the games with its source code uh, so we'd, we'd rather acquire the game and do the polishing ourselves as it is we never take a game live the way it comes to us typically when a game comes to us it's about 10 MB in size but after we are done optimizing the game we reduce the size by about 76 percent to about 2.4 MB that's the kind of optimization that we package into all of our games one of the trends over here, like there are different kind of games, uh, as far as 2D games are concerned. Are we talking about 3D as well? Uh, because yes. So yeah. uh, there are interesting frameworks in HTML5, uh, which, yeah. Some of these have now opened themselves up for, uh, you know, 3D rendering of graphics as well. 3JS is one that comes to mind. Yeah, exactly, right? So a lot of these guys have now started to at support for 3D rendering, which is, you know, pretty interesting because with you can't really see an ecosystem develop only on the basis of 2D graphics when games have reached where they have, right? So I guess the introduction or the advent of 3D um, graphic rendering within the realm of HTML5 uh, makes them very, very interesting for, uh, for serious developers to start putting effort behind it. So I, I guess uh, 3D in HTML5 games is something that we have waited for very, very patiently. Honestly, it took a little longer than it should have. But now that there are enough and more frameworks out there that are doing this, I think, yeah, we should see a lot more of these 3D games coming along. We are working on a 3D game ourselves, which we will soon take live to Facebook Messenger. And hopefully that will be one of the first good 3D games that Facebook Messenger has seen. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, hi, uh, it's a it's a follow up to what he asked, and I'll uh, add another question. Um, the first question is: After we do submit the game, uh, you said you would do the polishing, development, a uh, little bit of uh, optimization yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, after so publishing, if you find any problem with the game, with our game, uh, how is the agreement structured? Do we work on it? Very good question. Excellent question. So I think what we do is we would work on a model uh, where whatever optimization, etc., we require, we will, if you have to do it, we'll ask you to do it before we make the payment to you. After the payment is made, it's our responsibility. Got because it. we buy the source code of all of these games, so it doesn't make sense for us to go back to you and say that, you know what, on level three, there's this small bug. Well, it's our fault that we didn't find it. So, um, yeah. Got it. So another question, probably because I walked in a little late, sorry about that. Uh, WebGL games? Uh, so we will hold our comments on WebGL right now because WebGL on mobile is, well, you know how yeah. it is. WebGL on desktop, well, I would still say that it's picking up. Guys like Unity are doing their bit uh, to ensure that there's support for that. Uh, but I would still say that if you are uh, a web game developer right now, specifically if you want to you know, put your hands into HTML5, don't put all your eggs in the WebGL basket. We're coming from the other side. We actually have a portfolio of uh, Unity games and we want to get into HTML5. So. Right. We can quickly port it into WebGL and give you the... Yeah, I know I know what you mean. Uh, we could definitely work with you guys to try and see. We'll speak offline probably. Uh, we'll definitely try and see what can be done there. But WebGL has its own set of issues. Uh, on the mobile device, it's not that great a success. I mean, I would say it's pretty much a failure. On the desktop, it's doing well. But there isn't too much user playability for HTML5 games on the desktop because the days of Flash are gone. And today, all the portals that are really, really pushing HTML5 games in a big way have maybe 97, 98% of mobile users. Uh, one last question, I'm so sorry. No, no, uh, sorry. If I may ask from um, the distribution partners that you showed, which is working for you, Facebook, giving you the most money? So I am unfortunately not able to tell you who is giving us the most money because I'm mm. bound by... <laughs> that, that's why, like, if, if you can. Yeah, but I guess the right way to look at it is that where is the future of money in HTML5 games? And uh, in our limited understanding of this space, we think that messaging apps is the way to go because they have an inbuilt community. Uh, there is user interaction. It's not an isolated experience. A lot of messaging applications themselves worry about absorption of content to the extent that they work closely with developers and tell them that, you know what, this is right about your game, this isn't. So I think the community angle is something that is an inherent impetus which messaging applications are able to offer and others aren't. Having said that, well, it depends upon whose doors are you knocking on and at what point in time, whether it's in their larger scheme of things or not. I mean, even travel apps might work. But, you know, the advantage with messaging apps is that they are a platform by themselves. So even if you take one game, because they already have 4,000 other games, they'll be happy to take it. But today, if you go to a GoIB go and say that you have one game, one HTML5 game, then it may not fit in the roadmap for GoIB go, right? Having said that, if you take a catalog of 200 games like the way we do, then what we have the strength of is we have the strength of telling them that, okay, we'll give your users one new game every day or three new games every day, or depending upon where the user is, or depending upon the user's playability pattern, we'll use our AI engine and send the user the right game at the right time. If he's waiting for his flight, if his flight is delayed, send a push notification to the user, ask him to play a game. He'll love you for it. Maybe not, but chances are that he will. So, yeah. Um, if we do work on a revenue sharing model where Are you speaking as a developer? Uh, as actually a business consultant for a game developer. Understood, okay, so, so uh, as a game developer, right? So, well, yes, but what we prefer to do is, let's assume that you have a really nice game. What we would do is we will pay you upfront uh, licensing fees for that game. If you are giving that game to us exclusively or if you want to buy that game exclusively, the the proceeds for you are going to be much higher. If you buy it non-exclusively, it's going to be lower. We pay a one-time fee 
And then obviously if the developer comes to us and says that, okay, you know what, I found this platform, why don't you put the games there? Sure, we'll take it. But at that point in time, we don't want to be bound by a developer to say that, okay, don't take my games to X platform. Uh, the agreement that we signed is designed in a manner that we actually acquire global perpetual distribution rights to these games. So developers must be firstly in the position to extend those rights to us. If their set of rights is suspect by itself, then it reduces us to an uncomfortable position because we work with large players globally where copyright and IP infringement could be you know, an issue which can put our head on the chopper, literally. So uh, those are some concerns, but we are usually not used to receiving requests from developers to not take our games to a platform. To take our games to platform, Is that yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, well, chances are high that if that developer or that publisher is that platform that you're talking about, that messaging application is not already known to us, we'll take not just that particular developer's game, but also a lot of our games there. If we already are present on that messaging app and however that developer's game is not featured there and that developer is making a request, sure, we could do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I think we're a little, we're overshooting by a little bit. One more time this, in case you have any feedback, please feel free to. And yeah, I'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav.